Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Dean Christensen, the Digital Marketing Manager at Grid Game Systems. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today for the webinar, In Memory Computing, What is Driving the Internet of Things? We have three speakers today, each one approaching the questions from a, a different perspective. Jason Stamper is an analyst with 451 Research with 20 years' experience in the IT sector. Nikita Ivanov is the co-founder and CTO of GridGain Systems, a leading developer of in-memory data fabric used to drive many big data and fast data systems. And <clears throat> Ilya Sterin is the Senior Director of Engineering at Chronotrack, an innovative Internet of Things company that utilizes in-memory computing technology to process massive amounts of data in real time. So we'll hear from each of these experts in turn. But before we dive in, I have just a few quick administrative points to make. Uh, Jason, Nikita, and Ilya will present for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Now, you'll notice that just above the presentation screen is a questions button. Click there to ask a question at any point during the presentation. And we'll respond to your questions during the Q&A segment at the end. We may not have time to get all of the questions during this event, but we'll definitely answer all of them afterwards, so please take advantage of this opportunity to ask questions from these leading experts in the field. Also, I wanted to make you aware that we have uh, included a case study on Chrono Chronotrack's uh, implementation of the grid gain in-memory data fabric, as well as the PDF of today's presentation in the attachments area. And just one more item. Uh, you'll notice that there's a ratings button right next to the attachments button. Please do rate this webinar at the end and provide any feedback that will help us improve our presentations in the future. So with that, we're ready to turn the floor over to our first speaker, Jason Stamper. Jason, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dane. Um, so um, delighted to be a speaker uh, on this webinar. Um, thank you very much, everybody who's uh, who's dialed in, and thank you, uh, Dane and Grid Game, for having me speak at this event. Um, so my my topic really is the road to the Internet of Your Things, and um, as you'll start to see, some of what we're thinking about uh, the Internet of Things is that it's about focusing on on what's relevant to your company and not getting too hooked up on things like wearables and so on. Um, I'll come on to that later. Um, very briefly about my company, um, we've been going for 13 years. Hardly anybody knows about us, 451 Research, and yet we're the fourth largest technology company um, uh, in the area of technology analysis. Everybody's heard, of, of course, of, of Gartner and Forrester. We've been a well-kept secret. Um, we've not been brilliant at marketing, but we've made a number of acquisitions over the years, including the Uptime Institute, Yankee Group, uh, and so on. And we now uh, are the fourth biggest in the world, uh, with over a thousand clients. Um, and we're really making we're, we're making gains. So um, I hope that part of this webinar will also make you think about whether or not there's something that our organization has to offer your organization. But let's focus on the challenge that in hand then, the Internet of Things. So um, it's not that new uh, an idea. Um, people started networking up Coca-Cola machines um, as, as long ago as 1991. So it's not that uh, new an idea. Um, but it is something that now, with sensors becoming cheaper and devices becoming smarter, uh, makes a lot more sense and is easier to do. Um, now, I'm afraid to say for my American friends, and I, I do have many of them, um, it was also a British man who came up with the idea of the Internet of Things, just like Tim Berners-Lee did uh, with the Internet itself. Um, and I'm afraid it was a, a British gentleman called Kevin Ashton who came up with the term anyway, um, who was working at uh, the Auto ID Centre at Massachusetts Institute. So he was working at about, about how um, cars could be better networked. And um, 
some of the work he did started to work towards how you could see that devices could be networked up and so on. Um, so he kind of came up with the term, and we'll give him credit for that. Um, and he was a Brit, um, so that's all good stuff. Um, but, the, but the point is also that it was a, um, an idea that had been going on for many years. Just like many of these things, if you look at SOA um, or you know ESBs or whatever, there are many, many years of kind of ideas um, and thoughts that go into the process before we get to where we are with the actual um, problem that we're trying to solve. So what my IOT look like? Um, this is a diagram from IOTCO.org. Um, so basically, you know, at the bottom layer, if we start at the bottom, you know, you've got some sensors. They might be your smartphones, your iPhones, uh, your Android devices, they might be sensors in industrial equipment. Um, they are producing data that we may or no, may not want to analyze. Higher up the stack, um, you need to send that data somewhere. This is the network and telecommunications equipment stack. Um, you might need to um, distribute that data, share that data, etc. Um, Higher up the level, which is where we start to get into the area that I really cover, which is big data and analytics, um, you need to start to think about how you're going to store that data, analyze that data, um, and make sense of it. Um, and then as you go up the stack, after you've stored it somewhere, you need to analyze it, which might need decision support tools, it might need business intelligence, it might need streaming data, analytics, and then at the very top of the stack at the moment, we're looking at the sort of data which you're embedding into your own application. So instead of me sitting in front of a screen and asking questions of my data, it's already embedded into my applications, whether I'm a user or a developer or um, a customer or a partner, some of that application, some of that data is built into my application later on higher up the stack. I mean, one of the big questions that I'm often asked, um, and that I, you know, in, in complete honesty, I don't know the answer to, is does the Internet of Things really matter? Does it exist? Well, um, this was a study by um, GE on industrial applications, um, and they found that um, if this was applied properly and effectively, um, then efficiency gains of 1% could result in 15 year savings um, of all these things. And I won't read them out to you, but it, it just shows you, this is just one area um, of, for example, the airline industry, healthcare, um, patient and treatment flows, and fuel consumption in the gas industry. Um, just shows you, just, that's just a few areas where they're saying, you know, in this report, um, there's massive savings to be made. So, should we be looking at it? Yes, we probably should. Um, but also, of course, with caution and with care and without thinking that it's going to change the world like we think about many of these things in the technology industry. So, what's holding it back? And if it's been talked about since 1981, why aren't we there yet? Well, there are a few reasons. Um, the first thing is sensors are getting cheaper and um, easier to deploy and so on, but they're not free. And there's still an issue around, you know, how much uh, investment do we want to make in, for example, our supply chain. If it's a box of uh, you know, I don't know, cardboard, or if it's a box of toys or whatever, do we want to put sensors on it? Do we want to track that? Do we need to track that? Um, there are other areas, obviously, where it becomes more important. And I know, for, for example, that in the supermarket area, the most stolen goods are razor blades, and that's because the very high um, expense, relatively, and very small form factor. So that's an area where we might think about putting sensors on them, 
to try and reduce fraud, for example, and, and theft. Um, there isn't a standard for this Internet of Things. Um, some companies are starting to work together between themselves, um, but there is, certainly isn't an Internet of Things. They're starting to become networks of things. Um, this is one of the reports I'm working on at the moment. So, for example, Volvo, who I've spoken to recently, share their information about wheel traction control with the Swedish Road Authority in order to try and help the Swedish author Road Authority um, you know, send their gritters out to the right place and improve road safety. So Volvo is sharing some information with some organisations, but of course they certainly wouldn't necessarily want to share that information with Ford, and Ford wouldn't want to share that information with Google. So we're having little networks built up. For example, Nike might want to share its fuel band information with Garmin, or it might not want to. And so we're seeing these networks build up uh, rather than a complete true Internet of Things. And that's partly because the standards aren't there. And also, these companies don't really want to share all of their information with their competitors for obvious reasons. So there isn't a single standard. Um, and there's a balance to be struck between the benefits. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly, again, the Volvo uh, example was very interesting in that um, when they first announced that they had telemetry in their cars, they sold it as an extra add-on to customers. And they said to them that um, if they bought this add-on at the time of purchase um, and they had an accident, and the airbag was deployed, then Volvo would know about it and they'd either send in an ambulance or they'd phone them or whatever and help them. Um, and they had very low take-up of that, something like 13% take-up on, uh, on, on using telemetry for that reason. Um, a year or two later, uh, Volvo realized that actually what Swedish people wanted to do is have their cars warmed up before they got in them and they um, enabled people to turn on the heating with their smartphone, you know, half an hour before they went down to their car. And, and when they sold that as an extra add-on, they got 86% take-up, according to their CIO, who told me about that. So it's kind of like looking at the business case and uh, where, where the real business value is. And obviously users are going to be the real ones who decide on how the Internet of Things impacts them, and how the Internet of Things actually delivers real value rather than being something that a company can offer uh, you know, just because it can, as it were. This is a slide which I'm sure for many of you will be a little bit small, um, but it, it shows the growth in um, sensors and sensor devices. So this is uh, MEMS. Uh, which is the scale, is uh, microelectronic mechanical systems, including sensors and actuators. Uh, this is a study uh, not by 451, but by IHS, um, so all credit to them. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but you can see predominantly, obviously, the, the, the bluish, the dark, the, the greenish blue line um, is, is laptops and mobiles and so on. Um, obviously, they're already smart, so it's easy to network them up and get some uh, value from them. Um, but we're also seeing growth on the top line there from, uh, from gaming, from cameras, uh, from wearable devices, and so on. Um, and I think sensors also will, uh, will play an increasingly important uh, effect in all of this. So... You know, one of the reasons we did this particular webinar is because all of this uh, Internet of Things creates a challenge for databases as well. And traditional databases like Oracle, IBM DB2, you know, Sybase, uh, etc. Um, I, I suppose I should me mention SAP HANA as well. Um, you know, they weren't designed with the Internet of Things in mind. And so there's become a challenge in the sense that uh, application developers, DBA admins as well, are struggling to keep up with the challenges that some of this 
analytics is creating. So, you know, a study by my previous magazine, Computer Business Review, found that 98% of CIOs thought that um, IT was not delivering what the business expected. You know, that's 98% of CIOs think that the business isn't getting what it wants. Um, and that is because of the challenge of delivering fast, rapid analytics on time, on the platform that people need it, um, but without a huge development cycle. You know, it's all very well developing something that gives you real-time analysis, but if it takes you nine months to develop it, it's still not helping the business as much as they need. So these are some of the challenges that we've seen in the enterprise. So for data management, um, you know, first of all, Hadoop isn't going to save the world, I'm afraid. Um, it's very much batch, it's very much process oriented, um, it's very much uh, aimed at putting a lot of data in there which you don't know what to do with yet, but you might analyze later on. Um, so we're looking for new platforms, new analytic technologies um, that, that, that can break through the bottleneck of some of the relational technologies and thereby um, give business people the analytics that they want and start to analyze some of this real-time data that's very different from what we used to have. We used to have very structured, transactional data that came in because people made a purchase and it was a simple transaction. Now we're trying to analyze data that we're, that, that we're gathering every second from sensors on machinery, web logs, data and so on. It's much more complicated, it's much more difficult to do with traditional technology. So here's some of the answers um, and many of you will have looked at some of them. In-memory options have been added to relational databases, there's pure in-memory databases, there's streaming um, and analytics as a service and so on. The question is what exactly is your company trying to do? Um, which of these makes the most sense in terms of your existing skill set, which means uh, you have the least rewriting of existing applications and that you don't have to um, throw away uh, you know, existing investments and so on. Those are many of the sort of questions that you, you will think about when you come to those things. And also, where really is the business value? And you know, a lot of companies have phoned us up 451 and said, you know, we're looking at Hadoop, what should we do? It's like, if your question is what should you do, you, you probably haven't thought it out right just yet. Um, so those are a few thoughts from 451 Research on uh, in memory and on, uh, on the Internet of Things. I hope you found some value in that, and I'm now going to hand over uh, back to Nikita. Nikita, over to you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Great introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nikita Ivanov. I'm from Grid Game Systems. So what I'm trying to do, as Dan mentioned in the very beginning, is to kind of, all of us three, give us a little bit different perspective on IoT market and IoT technologies around it. So what I'm going to do is kind of talk about a technology that is frequently used and is gaining tremendous momentum in the IoT market, which is the in-memory processing, in-memory data processing. And uh, at Great Gain, here at Great Gain, we're actually developing one of the key technology in this space, in one of the leading technology. And I want to give you a quick overview, and the end of it basically kind of pivot into the how it's used in IoT applications, and we can uh, naturally dive into the uh, example with contract. So before we dive into the um, Great Gain's product, I always start any conversation about in-memory computing with, uh, with a couple of thoughts about in memory in general, why all of a sudden uh, we're talking about in memory computing in a, in, a, in a very broad spectrum of applications from IT to big data, fast data, and practically anything in the last day to a modern data processing. So, what's in memory computing? In memory computing basically is a very simple concept. As you move your critical data from slow spin disk and in a slightly faster flash systems, to a, a DRAM of computers across multiple computers in the clusters, things will go faster. And that's basically a simple definition of that. You know, what's interesting, you know, a couple of interesting facts about a memory or in-memory computing is that a DRAM, the RAM in your computers, is 
anywhere between 100,000 times to 5 million times faster than, for example, a spinning disk. It's a staggering uh, performance numbers. And that's what basically attracted a lot of people for the last, you know, two or three or four decades into the in-memory processing because if you do it right and if you have enough RAM, uh, things can go dramatically faster. Now, historically, we have pretty natural challenges to our to in-memory computing. One of the major ones was the cost. If you remember, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the cost of terabyte of RAM would be astronomical, and only big companies and three-letter agencies could afford that. That has changed in the last decade. And um, when I present about this topic, I always give an example that a cluster, let's say 10 computers, 10 commodity blades from Dell, uh, each having a 100 gigabyte of RAM, total capacity of a cluster is a one terabyte of RAM with all the gear, with all the networking gear, with all the power gear. This little cluster today costs less than 25K. Think about this. For the price, less than the price of a new car, you can buy a, a full functional cluster with a terabyte of RAM. Just to give you perspective about what terabyte RAM can do, just a short three or four years ago, uh, the entire working set of Twitter, which is about a week of tweets globally, was about seven terabytes. <clears throat> so that gives you essentially a, a pretty good uh, um, ratio between what you can do at what price today with the memory computing. And in the last you know, if you look at this chart, I know you barely, barely see that. On the right, there's a price of DRAM. Uh, what's interesting about this chart is that the price of DRAM is an exactly same trajectory as the price of spinning disks. And spinning disks today are essentially free. And the uh, price of DRAM goes about 30% uh, every year and a half. So the the price, the economics of a memory computer has dramatically changed in all the analysts believe that essentially it kind of crossed the pivotal point where the price, the economics of RAM is not is no longer a, a a problem. The RAM is available. RAM is cheap enough relative to its value that a lot of companies jumping on. But what really also changed in the last <clears throat> again five to seven, maybe to a decade, last decade, is that unlike 15, 20 years ago, we now have a tremendous demand. And the IoT is a tremendous force behind that demand. We didn't have the things like fast data or the big data in terms of the size and the volume velocity. We naturally didn't have the IoT as spread as, as we have it today. All of those things drive tremendous demand into the real-time data processing. I mean, you cannot build IoT system of any kind if, you know, your processing takes minutes. Sometimes even seconds not, not allowable in this, in this context. So the, the demand on the one side and economics on the other side is what basically the, this um, nexus of these two trends is what driving the rapid adoption of the memory computing. And the last thought I want to leave you with is this kind of provocative thought, but it's a very interesting one, is that if you think about in memory computing, this is practically a lost frontier in a data storage technology. Think about this. From late 60s, we used tapes for our predominantly for our, you know predominant data uh, storage technology. Late 60s, early 70s, we switched to hard disks, and hard disks with IBM systems and interest systems become available and and, and um, economically feasible. So we switched to disk, the hard drive disk and screen disk, and we had this technology being progressed up until in our early 90s. In mid-90s, we developed the flash technology, and from mid-90s to mid-2000s, the flash was the king speedwise. And now we're moving to a in-RAM, an in-memory processing of data, storage data, and that's fast and it's great. But think about this, what's next? If you think about it, there's nothing really next. We always knew that the, the absolute frontier absolute holy grail of data storage stored in RAM because it's a tremendously fast, it's as close as possible to application. And we essentially there. There is a software like we gain in some other projects and products. There is a economics there that men there, hardware is up in the there. What's next?
there's really nothing next. You know, people say, well, about CPU cache. Well, CPU cache is about three times faster than the DRAM, but it's very small capacity due to physical limits. So there's literally nothing else beyond in-memory computing, unless we fundamentally change the architecture of computers as we know them. And that's what gives in-memory computing, unlike Flash, a, a very different filter. This is not a stopgap solution. This is the basically a technology that is going to be with us for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years until we fundamentally rethink how we build our computers. And that's what makes the memory computing really exciting. So let me talk about what is it we do at GoodGain to really make this vision reality. What we develop is what we call in-memory data fabric. Essentially, it's a Java-based distributed software middleware that allows it to take data from a variety of traditional data sources that depict on the bottom of the slide, SQL, NoSQL databases, even the GDFS and Hadoop payloads, and move some or all of this data into the fabric. And your applications on top can now use this data in an in-memory fabric to run a variety of different types of use cases and types of payloads processing. And what makes the fabric a fabric is really the long set of different types of processing you can do on that data once it's in the fabric. You can do traditional MapReduce. We actually support three types of MapReduce application or processing. We support traditional Hadoop-based, Yarn-based MapReduce, and we support essentially two types of optimizing memory and MapReduce applications with mm -hmm. type of processing. We support traditional data grid use cases with full transactionality, full SQL, full key value access, and we'll talk about it as well. We support compute grids, where you basically can run in parallelized computations in a variety of different shapes and forms. We support traditional message passing, MPI style processing, MPP processing, just RPC, closure-based execution, variety of different things. On top of that, we support streaming types of payloads. We have a very interesting implementation of streaming with a full sliding window and SQL for streaming as well. On top of that, we have, you know, things, for example, like file system and Hadoop acceleration, event-based systems and whatnot. So when you basically start learning about Apache uh, grid game, and we're actually based on Apache Net project, the word fabric will start making sense. It is the, not just a one technology, one particular small use case. We to look at a memory processing more strategically. It will give you a strategic view on in-memory processing with a variety of different types of payloads you can process on that fabric. So let's talk a little bit quick uh, on a specific functionality that we have. Again, we only have about left about seven to eight minutes. So I'll be pretty quick here. So again, the key behind a fabric and the one thing I want you to remember is that it's not just a one use case. It's a variety of types of different types of payloads and types of processing. And it's a very important you know, distinction between what we do and the rest of the industry. Because in memory is literally just a generic storage layer. You can do lots of different things. It's not only SQL. It's not only MapReduce. It's not only streaming. It's not only compute. It's not only file system. You can do all of those different things. And different applications require a different mix of this functionality. And that's why we basically call it a fabric, where it essentially denotes the idea that in-memory is just a strategic storage layer for you. What you can do on it is a long list of different types of payloads. So, for example, data grid. Data grids are all about parallelizing data storage. It, how do you basically, if you have a long, large data set, how do you store this data set in a data grid? How do you parallelize? How do you transact? How do you load bounce? How do you fail over? How do you do processing of this data through a key value access, through a SQL access? We support all of that in the data grid. Compute grids on the other side deal with the parallelization of a processing. How do you parallelize your algorithms? And again, it's a Sounds very simple, but it actually has a lot of functionality behind it. Again, how do you load bounce? How do you fail over? How do you do clustering around that? How do you do all these different things? It's also part of the fabric. We have a service grid. Again, how do you run services with an SLA on a grid or on a cluster of computers? Lots of different options there as well. Streaming, yet another use case on exactly the same in-memory storage layer. How's it different from data grid? 
Well, it's different because trimming has no beginning and no end. It requires different types of processing. Typically, it's based on a sliding window of lost N events, lost five minutes, lost anything. So essentially, it's a sliding window. And you can define a function on that sliding window and get the callbacks from it as may, from application standpoint. So there are different types of processing. But again, it's based on the same fundamental idea in memory processing and utilizing the same, same storage layer. And the list goes on. For example, we had a very cool Hadoop accelerator that requires absolutely no change to code. It's complete plug and play acceleration for Hadoop. Again, the idea that we inject this in memory data fabric in the Hadoop stack, and we actually redeveloped the method using the HDFS to make it fully in memory. We have our own HDFS compatible file system and our own yarn based MapReduce implementation. Both of them give us this ability to inject fabric into the Hadoop cluster and really give the performance benefits. By the way, uh, it's pretty cool technology. We, if you run the um, data fabric in Hadoop uh, with absolutely zero code change, you get anywhere between two to 50 times faster processing of your unchanged MapReduce code written in Java, MapReduce, Hive, Big, anything you like. Pretty cool stuff. And then on top of that, we have a file system, we have a messaging, we have events, we have different data structures that are fully optimized for memory processing, and the list goes on. Once again, the, on this short kind of quick overview, one thing I want you to remember about in-memory data fabric is that it is a strategic view on in-memory as a storage layer. We think about it as this, and we provide you all these different types of processing and payload processing on that fabric. Quick slide about the change about the difference between open source and enterprise version. By the way, we are based on Apache Ignite. It's a full Apache project. Uh, everybody's welcome to look at. What Gregin does, we provided you basically enterprise version of that that has a number of a production features that you really like in production settings, such as security management, data center application rolling updates, and whatnot. So you guys can peruse this information right on our website if you're interested. A couple of words about a use case. It's kind of, uh, I think it's important to list those use cases to really understand where it's been used. We are used in a, in a, in a pretty wide variety of different use cases. Um, financial services would be one of the kind of our key use case for us. We, uh, the whole in-memory computing started there about 20, 25 years ago, and it still is today one of the top uh, users of this technology. So anything from automated, you know, trading systems, you know, any types of risk analysis, real-time risk analysis for portfolio, for trading, um, any kind of, you know, high-frequency trading applications and related applications would be what is being used here. Uh, we also use quite a lot in our, our online mobile advertisement, any kind of, you know, geo, you know, ad hoc advertisement. Uh, is really big in real-time processing with a lot of information we use there. Big data analytics is kind of amorphous term, but you will probably, you oh, you are hearing a lot about in-memory analytics, and the the key takeaway here is that everybody needs everything right away. And in-memory computing is all about performance, and therefore you see a lot of usage of that performance or in the technology and a lot of this analytics applications. You have big data. Essentially, big data sets needs to be analyzed in the quick and real time. Online gaming is another interesting idea. We used actually by Sony and quite a few um, uh, game tiles in the back end. Again, modern online gaming really shifted away from a console orientation to the back end orientation where a lot of functionality is in the back end, and that's where all the money is made by optimizing your merchant platforms for the online games. Interesting use case that kind of crosses the Industries is a SaaS enablement. Uh, we've seen a lot of customers and users basically moving from traditional client server architectures to the SaaS business and SaaS models. And what happens there is that essentially overnight you get into a dramatically more users hitting the same infrastructure. You have to have multi tenancy and you have to have very different kind of scalability profiles. And once again, in-memory processing helps dramatically here because nothing else can give you a three to four orders of magnitude performance increase the way, you know, comparing to disk and flash other than RAM, other than in-memory processing. And we've seen that with a um, source enablement trends in the last couple of years. 
One of the coolest examples and one of the coolest customers we had was a grown track, and Ilya will we'll talk a lot more in details about what grown track does. Uh, we worked with a grown track a couple of years ago, and uh, it's really one of the coolest examples we had. It's one of the pure IoT plays. They um, they captured thousands of uh, you know of, of events from other chips attached to the racers, and the contract you know basically does the race management and race automation, and uh, they collect those events, and they have to really process them in real time, uh, and unlike anything else, this is one of the one of the clearest IoT use cases we've seen in a while, and without. For that, you, Ilya, let me uh, switch to you so you can basically talk about the details there. Okay, great. Thanks, Nikita. Um, hi, my name is uh, Ilya Steren, and I'm the Senior Director of Engineering and Product Management here at Chronotrack. And uh, you guys probably noticed that I like black slides with white uh, text on them. Uh, unlike everyone else. Um, we're also, you can, you notice that there's a Lifetime logo here. We're a part of a bigger organization, which is Lifetime Fitness. Um, Lifetime Fitness is a uh, global gym company. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, in different states or different parts of at least the United, at least the United States uh, probably have been or seen a Lifetime gym. Uh, so I'll, I'll just jump right in into what we do and uh, what we did with uh, grid gain and just in memory computing. So, um, so uh, how do we keep our lights on? Um, again, we're a uh, kind of check to the global leader in endurance event solutions, uh, which means uh, marathons, triathlons, uh, cycling events, um, and so on. We do some of the biggest um, events out there, like the New York Marathon, Paris Marathon, you know, Santiago Marathon in Chile and so on. Uh, we, um, as uh, Nikita mentioned, we provide um, RFID tags, uh, and those tags go uh, for those of you that aren't runners, uh, those uh, RFID tags go on bibs that are then attached to the runner. Um, and as the runners cross various checkpoints in the race, uh, the, we have RFID readers that capture that data, and that data is then streamed over uh, GPRS modems or various other uh, networking means to our cloud servers. Uh, we also do registration of athletes uh, for participating in these events, and that's basically our uh, e-commerce platform. Uh, we do timing and scoring. Uh, so what timing and scoring is is basically what happens when this RFID chip reaches our cloud servers. Right? Uh, we aggregate the data, calculate the time and the rank of these athletes, uh, and we map, we, before we do all of this, we, have, we map the uh, actual RFID chip to an actual athlete that's participating in this event. So there's a lot of data processing. Uh, uh, we also do messaging in the media. Basically what that is is athletes and their family, friends, followers can sign up to receive notifications about their progress in the race. Uh, these notifications are through SMS, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Uh, we also do media, which is photography and finish line videos. We have various uh, algorithms that work with the temporal data that's streamed to us from, from our RFID readers, and we do the matching for the photos. So you can you know, go to the website, and out of the thousands and thousands of photos, can just look at the five photos of you. Uh, and the same thing happens with our finish line video. <clears throat> so... Uh, issues um, we had, and we still have some of these issues, um, as any company does. So uh, we've we've grown uh, quite rapidly and endured, you know, quite some growing pains uh, while we grew. Um, what was developed for a couple of events initially, uh, coming out of a startup, and a, a few thousand runners, not have to scale to thousands of events and millions of runners. Uh, our traffic patterns are somewhat predictable uh, in terms of what we know, how many, like how many events we do for the weekend and how many runners are participating in those events. But we can predict like the popularity of the event and how many people are going to be registering this weekend and so on. So this creates a lot of contention in our system, which leads to various interleaving of traffic patterns and so on, which are really hard to predict. We had, you know, we had low tests and, you know, they all passed with flying colors when we ran them, but only 
to be surprised on the weekend when the patterns were completely different. Um, so the combinatorial explosion, so thousands of races um, and a few million athletes doesn't sound like a lot, but the data points that are associated with timing these are quite large. So when you consider each athlete um, that crosses about three to five checkpoints and then um, our, uh, the RFID readers uh, transmit um, these these crosses and some, a lot of times they read they do multiple reads right so we don't just receive a single read for an athlete crossing a checkpoint uh, and each race then places the athletes in three plus brackets brackets are basically groupings of athletes for example your age group your overall group and so on so a 10,000 person race five checkpoints three brackets two reads per athlete quickly turns into you know 300,000 data points right and then multiply that by 50 races on the weekend and now you have your you know, about 15 million data points um, that we're processing. Uh, we sometimes have little control of the order and the way the data gets to us. Um, and even though we own the devices, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily control the devices at the race site. So race timing is a very intense exercise. So at any given time, you know, controllers are going offline. Someone forgets to configure something. Network goes out. It's raining and so on. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make is that we don't have predictable data flows. Our algorithms have to create order out of chaos. Uh, we started with a single um, relational database system. And although the rest of our software is pretty stateless and horizontally scalable, um, that was pretty easy to do from an um, architecture on the, on the software side, um, the database remained our single point of value, right, and the single point of contention and our relational database. So that was a big issue for us. And as any other startup, you know, we had to move fast. Uh, features trumped engineering purity. Uh, you know, no one wanted to end up with the greatest technical product and no customers. So we did, um, you know, we did our thing and along the way acquired quite a bit of architectural technical debt. And it wasn't very easy to pay it back at the time when we needed to pay it back quickly. Uh, So ideally, uh, this is where we wanted to get, right? Um, so we started thinking about our architecture. Some basic high-level necessities came out of that. Uh, we wanted to get away from using a relational database system for data that needed to scale. We wanted to be able to partition our data. Uh, that would allow us to basically horizontally scale our data storage. And since we're partitioning our data, um, you know, why move it around at that point? We can just do the calculations on that data right on within that memory. Um, basically, you know, uh, making computations in memory without any networking overhead was our goal or was our eventual goal. We wanted to be able to add and remove data nodes on the fly. That was a big deal for us. So the dynamic being horizontally scale, scaling uh, was big um, because of our traffic patterns and because we, they're unpredictable, we needed to be able to do that um, at any given point in time. Um, and, you know, um, while the genie was out of the bottle, we wanted also our system to be autonomous. Um, they're responding to any basically node outages, network fragmentation, et cetera, that can happen in the distributed system. So, you know, a lot of people stay away from distributed systems for as long as they can because of all the issues that, all the complexities that come with building distributed systems, or at least used to um, in the past. So what do we do uh, to make things better? Uh, so as any lean startup, we wanted to see improvements and we wanted to see them quick, right? Everything was a 24-hour turnaround. Uh, we started by simply distributing computations without any data storage changes. The data still had to be pulled from the database um, and it still traveled over the network, but at least we, you know, took care of the actual computation distribution. We didn't make it any faster at the time, but um, it was definitely super, super stable. Uh, the contention was still there. We still used a single database, but our computations were now distributed amongst multiple CPUs. We built this in a week. Um, it was right before Thanksgiving weekend. Um, our Thanksgiving weekend is our heaviest weekend. A lot of people, you know, want to eat, yeah, uh, sorry, want to run before they indulge in the turkey. And so there's a lot of like, turkey trots and so on. So we do a lot of races on Thanksgiving weekend. 
Um, we build a solution on top of grid gains, compute grid. Um, and the first time we deployed it was on the Thanksgiving weekend. It was pretty uh, nerve-wracking at the time, I remember. Uh, but the system ran flawlessly, like, all weekend. Um, I remember commenting to someone um, a few weeks later that, you know, we needed to go in and do some monitoring on the system, and I literally forgot where where this thing was running, right? It was just flawless. You know, if, if the box came down, uh, you know, we could add another box and so on. So everything was pretty flawlessly running. So the second thing we wanted to do, uh, the second stage in our endeavor was to utilize the in-memory data grid. Uh, we put data required for cal calculations into the data grid. Uh, we have to, at that point, we have to rewrite our algorithms to do the calculations or ranking, you know, the, all the queries and do them in memory. That transition was um, pretty straightforward, uh, as I remember. It's uh, been a couple of years. And the data, the great thing was the data was modeled very closely of how it was originally stored in our relational database. And this is because of the way uh, grid gain storage is. It's basically built on top of SQL so you can uh, model your data the same way you would in a relational database. Uh, you have to think about partitioning. You have to think about various other things, but you definitely don't have to, you know, jump through all the hoops that you have to with just regular key value stores. <clears throat> Um, our overall experience with grid game was really good um, overall, you know, from the first project. We've been working with them for a few years now. Uh, we, we did look at a few competitors. Uh, nothing really stood out at the time, um, mostly because the grid game guys really had a really intuitive, simple API and DSLs on top of, you know, their data grid, their compute grid, and, of course, we could just write SQL queries, right, which was, which was great. We were used to writing SQL. Um, and there, a lot of people, you know, think these days that the only way to scale is distributed NoSQL. Um, but there's nothing about SQL that makes it less scalable than anything else um, out there in the NoSQL store. It's, it's just mostly uh, the leftovers from the old, you know, relational database world. If you look at most of the NoSQL vendors out there, they've now started to add their own variations of SQL to their product, right? They don't call it SQL. They call it some other query language. But they, they're all doing it. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, I remember by Michael Stoneberg, I was at a conference with, uh, watching one of his presentations. Um, he said, no SQL folks are basically doing what relational folks did and learned 30 years ago, and they're now doing basically on-job training. And what came out of that, you know, 30 years ago was SQL, a declarative way to, you know, to, to run queries on your, on your data and, and a way to sort of model your data. And it, it, you know, doing it with NoSQL is quite a bit harder. <clears throat> so after we did this, what did we? What were the results? All right, we went through all of these exercises. We engaged in this. Um, the second project was uh, a little lengthier than the first one. Um, and what did we get out of it? Uh, our timing and scoring, which we used to call quote unquote real time, uh, at the time was two to five minutes. And we shaved it down with this last project to basically less than 10 seconds. Uh, queries that rank athletes, so athletes get ranked based on their age groups and their overall groups and so on. Uh, they run in real time versus before we basically have to pre-cache our rankings by materializing things in a relational database. And that was just a very lengthy, heavy process. And it was, it, it all happened on this, so it took you know, up to five minutes at times, depending on the complexity and the size of the race. The other thing that we have now is we can add capacity on demand. We didn't have that with our relational database. We, uh, with our relational database, we were basically we run everything on Amazon AWS, so we used their RDS box. We were consuming at the time, I think, their 8x uh, box, which was the largest, and we were still running out of capacity on the weekend. And uh, now we can add capacity on demand, um, when heavy weekends are coming up, we can add more nodes. We can take them down as needed. So, so what are we doing now? Um, this is a joke, of course. You know, we took a long, hard nap afterwards. It was uh, a lengthy. Uh, process from going from startup to, you know, fixing all of our scaling issues, uh, but we did it. And, um, but seriously, what we're doing is, um, 
we're growing pretty fast. Uh, what the, our new architecture allowed us to do is basically focus on our product and features and not have to worry every weekend whether, you know, our system is going to go down or whether we're not going to have enough capacity and so on. Uh, we also learned a great tool, uh, which is Grid Gain, um, and now uh, the open source Apache Ignite. And, you know, we, u- we are planning on using it uh, further down the road for other projects uh, to help us scale um, other pieces of our infrastructure that need scaling. And uh, last but not least, uh, you know, obligatory, we're hiring because we're growing, and uh, we have many positions in engineering and product. And anybody's interested, you can connect with me, and my contact information is on the screen, and I'm sure the slides will also be emailed to you. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, Ilya, and uh, thank you, um, Jason and Nikita, for your presentations as well. Um, we do have a few questions uh, that have come in, and, and so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, take a few of those questions for the for the folks. We don't have a whole lot of time uh, for questions, but uh, we'll get uh, as many of, of them as we can in here. Um, I've got a question for Jason. Um, Jason, uh, what role do you think Hadoop will play in the era of the Internet of Things? Um, thanks, Dane. It's a great question. Um, I think um, Hadoop will be used for um, storing stuff that we don't yet know what we want to do with it. Um, and to some extent, that's a bit of a, um, a contradiction because you know companies might ask themselves why they really want to be storing stuff that they don't know what the value is uh, yet. But but they certainly will be. Um, in the area of the Internet of Things, as, as the questioner called it, um, there's all sorts of data that's going to be flowing in from sensors, uh, machines, web logs, uh, uh, other computer logs, and so on. And um, I think some companies will store some of that in Hadoop, um, and some of it they'll they'll try and analyze on the fly using more real-time systems and more analytic uh systems like grid gain um i think hadoop's failure so far is that it's mostly geared up towards batch processing it's not really designed for real time analytics of course there are projects in the open source space like uh, apache storm and uh, apache spark streaming which are trying to deal with some of that uh, deficiency um but for the moment i think uh, Hadoop is sort of somewhere to, to put your data that you don't know what to do with yet. Um, and people have called it a data lake, but of course once you've got it all in there, um, it become it, it can become what some other analysts have called a data swamp in, in, in the sense that it's very hard to know what's in there and, and how to then analyze it and get value from it. So uh, a very long answer, but to summarize, I think it will have a role to play for data that you don't know what to do with yet. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, great answer. Uh, here's a question for Nikita. Uh, isn't in-memory computing dangerous since memory is temporary storage and power loss means data loss? How is this being protected? Memory processes faster than hard drives can. They can't be in sync. Well, I think it's like at least two questions in this one. Um, so the, the question about um, durability and memory solutions has been raised for the last quarter century, and we found a ways to deal with this long time ago. So there is a backup strategy where a data is backed up on a multiple computers in a cluster. Uh, there is naturally an ability to do synchronous and asynchronous backup to local drives if you want to do that. On top of that, there is a, an option of data central application if you really want to have a geographically distributed data store and kind of disaster you know, recovery situation, you can do a geo distribution between multiple data centers. On top of that, we actively working with a newly developed non-volatile RAM, which is the entire topic of conversation we can have. So 
on top of the features that I mentioned already, you know, a year or two from now, you know, we're going to have, you know, pretty good availability of a non-volatile RAM, which is called AMD Beams, and this whole issue will disappear as a, as an issue at all because RAM will become non-volatile. You can unplug the RAM from power, plug it back. It's going to retain its data uh, basically without any issues. So that issue is solved today and is going to be solved even more elegantly going forward. Now, the question about um, synchronization between hard disks and RAM is somewhat related to that, but not necessarily. Um, there is a great technology built in the grid game specifically to keep your RAM storage and whatever else disk-based storage, whether it's just a file system or, you know, your database, SQL, or NoSQL, or Hadoop, to keep those two in sync and in sync in a way you want it to be. You know, if you want to have a full transactionality synchronization, you have that, but obviously you're going to pay the performance penalty there. You can have all kinds of optimizations around that. You can do it asynchronously in a buffer, if not or not. So you can basically have synchronization between your RAM and between your non-RAM storage in any way possible you want, all the way from full synchronization to a very fast asynchronous way. And you as a developer, you know, you have the knob to turn and decide which type of synchronization, if any, by the way, you need to have. <coughs> Okay, excellent. And, um, you know, we just have uh, probably time for one more question, and I've got this uh, question for Ilya. Uh, Ilya, maybe just uh, like a one- to two-minute response on this. Um, someone asks, uh, what other in-memory computing solutions did you try before deciding on grid gain? Yeah, so uh, we tried – so when we first started off, we – we tried, I remember, um, this was many years ago, a company called Gigaspaces. Basically, a, uh, it was an in-memory Java space architecture model. It was a, it was a good architecture at the time. Uh, but the solution, the, the system itself had a lot of things to be sort of desired. Uh, had pretty bad monitoring that I can remember. So, you know, even though everything was running in the grid, it was really hard to know when things went wrong and where to look and so on. Um, and then uh, grid management capabilities were pretty weak. Um, and this, we were also using them, I think this was like um, back in 2009. And it was right before the financial crisis. And I think all of their uh, customers at the time, they weren't an open source solution. And all of their customers were um, financial companies. And so they, they lost a lot of business and almost went out of business. I think they're still in business. Um, and I'm not sure what they do now. I think they they focus more on very specific solutions, but I won't comment on that. We also, as probably any other company, uh, looked at Hadoop um, pretty extensively. And um, me myself, you know, especially working in a startup, we don't we don't have a, a huge infrastructure team. Um, Hadoop requires a lot of infrastructure, and not only from a hardware standpoint, but just from a management standpoint. It was just a nightmare. Uh, and then everything is sort of has to be programmed to a very rigid, you know, MapReduce model. It fits very well for some use cases, but it doesn't in others. And then the, the whole idea of, of batch versus real time, I think, was also disconcerting with Hadoop, right? We needed answers in real time. And at the time, you know, Hadoop was uh, a batch solution and we couldn't wait that long. Uh, and we also, I think, um, Again, it's been a while, but I remember we looked at some data on compute grids. Um, uh, they were they were separate, though. You know, they were I mean, there were there were distributed storage solutions, and there were there were other tools to allow you to distribute your jobs uh, around you know your, your CPU nodes, but none of them were very well integrated, right? So if you wanted to actually have data affinity and you wanted to store your data and you know and compute that data within that same sort of memory segment. You can do that, um, or at least you can do that very easily without a lot of integration and so on. So uh, at the time, and I, I think it still is the case, I think because uh, Great Game is just, you know, uh, the leading solution out here. And I haven't, at least I haven't seen anything that, that beats it. All right. Okay. Thanks, Ilya. And we're coming right up against the end of our time. I, I did want to remind everyone that the uh, – uh, presentation is in the attachments area along with the case study that I mentioned earlier. And I also did want to just go ahead and, and uh, let you all know that 
Um, the first ever in memory computing summit is coming is coming up in the, on June 29th through 30th in San Francisco. The event is uh, sponsored by a lot of the leaders in the uh, in memory computing space like SanDisk, SAP, MemSQL, DataTorrent, ScaleOut Software, and of course GridGain. Uh, when many of the top experts in the field will be speaking, so uh, there's still time to get some early bird discounts. Uh, so check out the discount code here. And you will find that discount code in the PDF of uh, today's presentation as well. So with that, I think we're out of time. And um, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I hope you got a lot out of it. And uh, have a great rest of the day.